In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to relax and pin uh, dried butterflies. I'm going to use this pair of Raja Brooks bird wings, Trogonoptera. These are uh, from uh, Indo-Australian region. They're protected. All the bird wings are protected, um, but they're raised on farms, so it's actually a good thing. It's a sustainable uh, resource that um, can bring, you know, money into local communities and developing areas. Um, they're ship dried like this uh, in a paper envelope, and they need to be rehydrated before we can pin them up. There's a couple of legs off here, but we'll take care of that. So the first thing we're going to need uh, is a relaxing chamber, and I've just get a plastic tub with a lid that seals, and then I use some paper toweling on the bottom uh, to hold the water. Then we'll get a sheet of foil to support the specimen. We want to make this about the same length as the uh, box. <clears throat> and we want to support this off the bottom of the container so that the moisture can move around easily. And we do that like this. Sort of fold it like in a, an accordion. And that gives some air space between the, uh, there we go, between the bottom and the uh, butterflies. Also, we, we don't want the butterflies to lay directly on a moist towel because uh, we don't want to get them actually wet. We just want to uh, humidify them. So we'll just add some water and make sure that gets good and soaked. Maybe pour the excess off here a little bit. We just want a nice humid environment. And then the foil goes on top of that. Now, typically if the butterfly has been very dry, they're a bit fragile. You can just set the envelope on top of the foil like this. Leg. And uh, usually I'll let this sit for maybe a day just like this uh, to soften them up. just makes it uh, less likely to break legs and antennas off. And once the butterflies have been in the chamber for a little while, it sort of softens them up a little bit. And we want to relax the wings. I use uh, an insulin syringe and a little bit of just plain tap water. And then we grasp the butterfly by the thorax and uh, just behind the back legs where the abdomen joins the thorax you can stick a needle in right into the thorax and then just inject a little bit of water into it and then this water inside the thorax will soften the wing muscles now these specimens have been relaxing for a day and we'll see how they look. Oh yeah. Yeah, the wings are very soft. You, you want them nice and soft and flexible. Um, if they're stiff, just put them back and let them go a little bit longer. This is the female. Oh yeah, very nice. This is perfect. Okay. So, let's start with the male. get out our spreading board. Now I'm going to use a the largest pin I have. This is a big butterfly. So I have a number five pin. And you need to move the wings aside. Push the pin through the center of the thorax. Dead center. And you want to get the pin in straight this way and this way. 
and then when you push it out through the bottom, if it comes out between the legs, right in the center, then you've got it pinned properly. And then a quick double check to make sure it's straight, and it is. Now, you need to place the pin in the very center of this slot. Makes everything line up better. And then also make sure that the pin is nice and straight, not tilted forward or back or side to side. So that looks pretty good. And you want it just so that the wings are at the same level as the uh, spreading platform. Now I'll take a large pin and brace the abdomen on each side because I'm going to be pulling the wings up and that will pull the abdomen, rotate the butterfly on the pin. So now we're ready. Now we use um, these translucent sheets, it's called glassine, to hold the wings down. And uh, I just buy a pad like this and I have these sheets and I can custom cut them to fit, uh, you know, whatever I'm doing. In this case, I'm using uh, this larger spreading board. And so just to make sure that the glassine is nice and straight, um, usually I will lay it on the spreading board straight and fold a crease in it and then make sure the edges line up so it's nice and straight and then take a scissors and cut the extra end off and then turn it around and just cut a very thin strip on the folded bit so that I have two sheets with nice straight edges. To start with I will use the sheet on the right side and just hold the wing down with a couple of pins just to keep it out of my way. And I'll start with the left side. So I'll put the glassine over the wing. Now the fore wing of the butterfly, the very edge is a stiff vein and you can grab that with the tip of a pin. Just stick it in a little bit. You don't want to poke a hole through the wing because you don't want to have holes in the wings. I'm going to turn this light on. There, it gives a little less shadow. Um, and then I grab that edge of the wing and I can draw the wing up. And I want the bottom edge of the forewing right here to be perpendicular to the vertical axis of the body. And that's just a standard. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but that's just the standard. Now, up here at the top, I line the glassine up with the edge of the wing. And this is important for me, my getting symmetry later. Now, to secure the wing, uh, I, I put a pin through the glassine right next to the edge of the wing. And I'll use several of them. This specimen's very relaxed, so the wing's not going to want to pull back down. Sometimes there's a little bit of tension in the wing and um, the wing will want to go back down and you really need to brace it so that it doesn't. And then uh, on the outside edge also some pins to hold it down. Now to bring the hind wing up to in the right position I lift up the glassine like this and you can see I got a nice view of the bottom edge of the forewing. And I can do the same thing. I can grab a thick vein on the hind wing and bring it up. Now, I'll, I'll do this at different levels for different butterflies, depending on what makes sense. Uh, there's a nice uh, swath of color here. I want to keep that. So I think I'm going to bring it up right until the edge of color here um, lines up with the uh, forewing. Yeah, right there. You can also notice uh, this wedge shape here, the dimensions of that. There's also a little fold here, right here, on this wing, and uh, I don't want to flatten that out, so this is actually a really good position. Now I'll use the pins again to brace the glassine right up against the wing, right next to the wing, and just use as many pins as I think it's going to take to make sure nothing slips out of place until it dries. Put another one up here on the forewing. There. 
That's well done. Now I'm going to flip it over and do the other side with the same technique. Now in order to get these wings to match up properly, uh, what I do is I line up the top edge of this glassine paper with this glassine paper. And I usually just eyeball it uh, and then put a pin at the bottom to hold it in place so it doesn't slip. Now you could, uh, technically you could check, you could um, measure it like this with some tweezers and I can see I've got it right on. Then uh, the same thing, grasp the, four, the thick vein on the forewing and bring the wing right up to the top of the paper right here. So that will make sure that these wings are in the same position. And then brace it with some pins. And a couple on this side. And I'm going to do the same thing with the hind wing. Lift up the glassine. Use a pin to grab a vein. Pull it up into the same position and then put the glassine to hold it down. Now you can compare the shape of this triangle with this triangle right there to make sure that the wings are symmetrical. And then a few more pins to hold the lower wing in place. And one more on the fore wing here. Okay, now we have to set the antennas. I can pull these bracing pins out now. We don't need those anymore. Um, if the thorax has turned a little bit, now's the time you can nudge it one way or the other and make sure that the thorax is nice and straight. Um, we can brace the abdomen. I did actually inject this abdomen with water and straighten it out because it was a little crooked. And um, there's a little bend in it so you can do a little shaping if you need to at this point. That looks pretty good. Now I'll grab some finer pins, these are like twos, to uh, manage the antenna. And uh, we want the antenna to look, you know, nice and symmetrical up in front. That's actually the way that the butterfly holds them too. And you just use uh, pins to make a little brace to hold the antenna. I'll do the same with this side. Just get it braced in the right general area first, and then we can fine tune it a little bit. I'm going to bring this one up a little bit. Um, yeah. There, that looks pretty good. Maybe bring the tip down a little. Yeah. Bend this one around just a little bit. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, and then this is ready. Um, however long it takes to dry, if it's really moist and it's humid, it might take longer, several days, a week, uh, just depends. Uh, now on this female, the head is uh, twisted to one side, and uh, this will make it difficult to get the antennas to line up. Um, you can usually just grab the head, I usually just use my fingers on a big butterfly or tweezers on a smaller one, and bend it back in the opposite direction for a moment until it stays centered. It's also tilted a little bit. It's just easier to do this before you've pinned it up. So You can spin the head around 180 degrees without it seeming to cause any problems. There, that's much better. All right, again, a large pin. Get a clean one. Large pin through the center. Straight down through coming up between the legs. Yeah, that looks good. No, oh, it's a little bit tilted too far. Let me straighten that out. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to make sure everything's straight, to get the pin in straight, and to get the butterfly or moth aligned properly on the spreading board. Otherwise, it just makes everything a lot more difficult. 
there. And bracing the abdomen. It's a, not too far. Get that nice and straight. Now I just need to position the antennas, and the head is tilted a little towards one side, so I'm just going to use a pin, a fairly large one, and I'm just going to butt it up against the, the face of the head and tilt it to one side. Yeah, there we go, and that actually gets it right in the right position. And then, just like the male, we can get the antenna positioned. And a little bit of an adjustment to the right antenna. There. I'm going to get the, at this one the abdomen sticking up a bit, so I'm going to push it down with the pins and get it nice and level. There. That looks pretty good. Put a pin up here at the tip. Just double check and make sure everything's in place. Uh, this hind wing has slipped a little bit. Yep, I can see it has slipped. So I'm going to spin it around. You can always make a correction. This one's a little stiffer than the male, and so, like I was saying, the muscles sometimes, if they're a little stiff, can pull the wing back down out of place. Uh, a little bit more. So it matches up with the other side. That looks good. Now I might just use a few extra pins on this hind wing since it slipped a little bit, just to really hold it in place. There. Yeah, that looks great. Let's double check this one. Yeah, all looks great. Okay. Now we just need to let these dry. These specimens have been sitting for a couple days and they're dry now. So we're going to pull the pins, see how they look. Okay, so this is the female, a lot less green on it, white patches on the wings, and the male. Now these are very nice specimens, but unfortunately they don't have any data, and I'm um, always disappointed in that. Uh, it's a couple of problems. One is that the specimen isn't really useful for research anymore if there's no data, uh, the data meaning when and where it was collected. Or, and, or where it came from. And also, I, I can't really identify the exact subspecies without a location. There are uh, nine subspecies in this uh, genus that I can find, or in this species that I can find. And um, they're from different islands uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific. And so I don't, um, it's, it's more difficult to tell. I might be able to get some idea just by looking at the wing patterns, but I can never really be certain. Uh, I do have some of the other subspecies, and so I'll make some comparisons, and we'll see if we can figure it out. Now, this male has a couple of legs missing, 
so I'm going to glue those back on. And it's easy enough just to look on the bottom and see where the legs are absent. Uh, it's missing a uh, hind leg on this side and a uh, hind leg on this side, so there must be one from each side. And if I look at the legs up close, I can see that they're the same. Each leg is slightly different size, the front and the middle and the back. And these two are identical, so it must be the, um, the, both the back legs. So I can just put a little dot of glue where the leg would attach. And then I can put the appropriate leg. You can tell because the leg bends a little to one side, so it must be this one. Oops, no, it's this one. Yeah, that's right. And then I'll flip it over and put the leg on the other side. Even though you can't see the legs when you're looking at the uh, specimen from the top, it's still best to, if you have the parts, to reattach them and have it as intact as possible. And just get it into position. Yeah, okay, that looks good. Just let those dry for a little bit. Now we'll pull out the other specimens of different subspecies I have and see if we can compare them and figure out uh, which one this could be. Uh, Jordani is found uh, in the Palawan Island in the Philippines. It's an endemic, so that's the only place that it's found. Uh, the top one is Brookiana Brookiana, and Yes, and this is the female Brookiana Brookiana, and this is uh, Brookiana tr uh, trogon, which is from Sumatra, and this is Brookiana albicens, which is from Malaysia. The, this one's a little bit larger, uh, but there may be variation in size within the species as well. Uh, you can see that the wing patterns the amounts of green and the placement of the pattern is slightly different uh, for the different species. And uh, there may be some underside differences as well between them. Although the differences are certainly subtle. So just by looking at wing patterns, it might be pretty difficult to figure out which species the new specimen is. It's probably uh, Albison's the wider green patches seem to match that best. But we'll have a closer look at that and see if we can figure it out. All right, I took a few minutes to look at these. And the, uh, the one that it seems to match most closely is uh, Albicens, the subspecies Albicens. Uh, the patterns on the hind wings especially seem to be most closely matched to that. And it's a little bit larger, too. I mean, it's about the same size as Albicens. Now, I have the advantage of having a female as well. And uh, I have a female uh, Brookiana Brookiana, and this one, the patterning on the hind wings is quite a lot more bold, uh, more white, defined white edges, and more green than the um, Brookiana Brookiana female. So I, I think we could safely eliminate this as being uh, Brookiana because the females don't match. I don't have a female of these two to compare it to, but if I had to guess, I would say it's probably Albison's. Now, it's still important to label them, even if we don't have data, uh, because, you know, we always try to do the best you can um, labeling things, so, they're, so it's as useful as it can be. So I use these uh, you know, uh, acid-free paper uh, labels and a uh, very fine tip pen, and I'm going to uh, write the location as um, uh, the Albison's location, Malaysia, but with a question mark. It just shows that I'm not really sure. That That's my guess, but I'm not really sure. Uh, I think it's okay to put information on a data label that you suspect, again, if you use a question mark, so it indicates you're not sure. And I could put uh, the, also the subspecies Albison's on there with a question mark uh, also, just to show that I'm not really sure, but that's my best guess. Uh, it's important in labeling to be as accurate as possible. Uh, and not to put anything down there that um, isn't true, uh, just, a, just a complete wild guess, unless you have some indication that it, it's, it's just your best guess.
Now I didn't have the date either, so what I'll do in this case is I'll just write pin 2016. Um, it's not very accurate, but it's not wrong. It just indicates that the specimen had to be collected sometime before 2016, which doesn't seem to matter very much right now, but uh, if it's 100 years from now, it will give somebody in the future an idea of at least uh, the era when this thing was um, collected. I also put the gender markings on there, male and female markings, if I know them. In this case, it's pretty obvious. Now, looking at these specimens, this is a very good example of how uh, one, of the, one of the ways that speciation occurs in evolution. Uh, these uh, butterflies live on different islands, and there's many, many different islands, and the populations of the butterflies then uh, become isolated from each other. On each island, that population is exchanging genes among themselves, but not with uh, genes, uh, species, individuals from other islands. It's true occasionally one might, you know, wander over in a storm, get blown over or something, but you still have isolated um, gene pools, and this is how uh, speciation occurs. Uh, we have here three subspecies, um, which are very closely related, uh, almost certainly could interbreed. You could hybridize these or interbreed them because they're the same species, uh, Trogonoptera, uh, Trogon albicens, and Burkiana burkiana. Um, now this one, though, uh, Trogonoptera trojana from Palawan Island is a different species. And it's uh, been isolated from these others long enough, it's changed enough, that it warrants a uh, species designation. Now, I suppose it's possible it could still interbreed. I don't know about that. But the physiological differences are sufficient uh, to make it another species. And it's pretty obvious just looking at it, too. It's really uh, quite different. So geographical isolation is one of the ways that uh, groups of organisms can uh, form new species through the process of uh, natural selection and, and evolution. And finally, I have one last specimen to show you. Uh, this is one that I pinned uh, in the resting position. So if you saw one along a stream side in a forest in Malaysia, uh, this is the position they take when they're uh, naturally at rest.